Hi everyone, welcome to PlutoCon. My name is Fons and I'm Pluto's main developer. And my main motivation for working on Pluto is education. I think that computation is an extremely powerful tool in education and we have to make it easier for teachers to use it in their class. So that's why I was really excited to work on a project uh, during the development of Pluto. During the fall semester of 2021, I work with the Julia lab on teaching uh, the course computational thinking, where we try to teach mathematics by showing the computation instead of first showing the mathematics and then the computation. Uh, we had lots of cool, like famous celebrities teaching the lectures. And that was, that was awesome. The lecture material is, is really high quality. Um, and for example, we had lectures like this one where Kind of a shockingly effective way to do that. So I'm going to give the high level view of how this algorithm. So you have three blue and brown using Pluto notebooks um, to show the computations that go behind these mathematics. So this was really exciting. And for the next semester, the spring 21 semester, we wanted to do something new, which is um, all of the notebooks that the lecturers use. We uh, automatically turn them into the website and they become like um, a book, like an online book about computational thinking. And this used to be difficult in Pluto, automatically exporting a notebook to a web page um, because you needed a web browser to generate those files. Um, but now over the past months, we kind of changed the internals of Pluto to be able to um, take a state object, which can be generated just by Julia, which contains all of the notebook state, the inputs, the outputs, etc., um, and load that in as if it's connected to the real server. And so that's um, our new website. So for a new website, every page uh, is a Pluto notebook. So here we're in chapter 1.1, and you see that this is <clears throat> Pluto, and actually this window on the right um, it's it's the real Pluto editor. It's not just an export. The only thing we did was we hide the bar at the top with the Pluto logo and we disabled the buttons. Um, so that was the first thing, automatically using so a GitHub action to generate uh, a website out of these notebooks. And so we really believe in learning by doing, and we want the students to run the code, to do the experiments and discover these things for themselves. Um, the problem was that in the fall semester, students had to install Julia, download Pluto, and then get the notebook from a GitHub. Uh, and it was a long process. And I think we lost a lot of um, students in that process. So they would see the video, get excited, but then be demotivated by having to install all of these things. Um, so the next thing I worked on was to add a button here, which is uh, a binder button. So, uh, my binder is, uh, a nonprofit organization that, that can run scientific notebooks in the clouds. Um, they're really great. And we managed to get a Pluto kernel working there. Though normally it just runs Jupyter notebooks. Um, and so it can connect in the background. So, so when I click, <clears throat> it will start loading a binary kernel in the background. And when it connects, it can like hot swap the backend. So it will go from a static file to a live binder session, <clears throat> which is awesome. Um, the problem is, as you can see, it's still loading. It takes quite a while, <clears throat> um, at least two minutes. And this is mostly because we're using Julia. So when it connects, it will need to start Julia, run everything for the first time, um, install the packages that we're using in this notebook. So <clears throat> yeah, it's still not, it's still not quite to the point where you, like, you, you see some kind of cool simulation and you start playing with it and discovering things. We worked on Pluto Slider Server, which is a web server that you can deploy for your website that will take all the bind inputs and make them work directly on the website without having to wait for any kernel to start. So for example, right now I'm on the website and let's see, 
has a slider here and I can move these sliders and you see that this um, pixel changes instantly. It even works with webcams. So here's a webcam input. And when I take a picture, <clears throat> you see that using Julia code without JavaScript or anything like this, um, I can turn that into a kaleidoscope image. Okay, so let's recap for the website. We have three things. First one uh, is we have a static notebook preview for every notebook on the repository and it's generated by a GitHub action. So whenever we push to the repository, uh, a new static preview for that notebook is generated. Uh, second, we have the Pluto Slider server, all slide ins, buttons, everything works directly on the website. And then finally, uh, because Pluto can switch backends dynamically, we can connect to a binder session in the background. So how can you make sliders and buttons work directly on the website? So the first stop might be we run uh, just one Pluto server and every visitor connects to the website. As an example notebook for today's demonstrations, I have this, uh, I have a slider for dogs, slider for cats, and here I combine the two into a single um, text, it works like this. And then I have a text field and it says, I like whatever you typed in. And so if everyone would be connected to the same Pluto instance, then everybody's sliders would be connected and you would see each other's inputs and you would see each other's outputs. So that's not what we want. Okay, so the next thought might be for every person who connects, we start up their own Pluto server, but that will take too long and that's the problem we're trying to avoid in the first place. Okay, so we want to try to get all visitors to use the same Pluto process without desynchronization issues. So what exactly are the problems? So the first one obviously is that all visitors can now edit the notebook, even though they're just visiting your website. Um, the solution is quite simple. We disable the editing and then nobody can edit the notebook. All right, next the inputs are linked. So that means that sliders get each other's values. Um, also quite simple, we disable this feature and then it's not a problem anymore. So the only one that remains is that outputs are linked. And to demonstrate this, let me show you what it looks like when you disable these two features. Okay, so if we disable editing and we disable synchronized sliders, then you essentially have the first version of Pluto Slider Server. And right now you see two clients connected to the same website. So the slider is not synchronized and you see that it's working. But if I now move the first slider on the right, you see that it's now telling me that I have nine dogs and seven cats, even though my slider is still at one. And the reason is the slider server, which is running the notebook, there, cats is still set to seven because that's the most recently set uh, bond value. And to understand this problem, how do bonds normally work in Pluto? So whenever a bond is set, <clears throat> um, it sends a message to the server just saying, for example, if you move the dog slider, dogs is now five. Then the Pluto server responds with the things that changed um, after running the cell. So it says cell three is now five dogs and one cat. Then you set cats to nine and it says five dogs and nine cats. You set dogs to four, it says four dogs and nine cats. And now you set dogs to five again and you get five dogs and nine cats. The problem here, which is what we were experiencing, is that this is stateful. So this request, bind dogs to five, gives a different response than this request. So in both requests, I'm saying dogs is five, but depending on the things that happened before it, we get a different response. And so this is the problem. This is what we need to avoid. So um, the next thing I tried was whenever you move one slider, we tell the server um, the values of all bonds, like as a single collection, and it will run all of them at the same time. Okay, so this is great. Um, and it actually worked quite well, but then you get some new problems. A notebook that we common, like, often we had in the course was 
like a couple of sliders and a plot, and then a couple of sliders and a plot. And they're all just like one slider controlling one plot. But with a strategy like this, it means that changing any one of those inputs will send all inputs, then run all of the plots and send all of them back to the visitor. So it took more time and it was using more network than we needed. So here comes graph theory. Um, instead of sending everything, we use like Pluto's analysis to figure out just the variables that we need to send. And in this notebook, you can see that when I'm changing dogs, the cells that will run is just this one cell and it doesn't depend on the favorite foods. And so we create a bond connections graph, um, which you can see if you open the JavaScript console on a website like this. The first thing it will print is the bond connections. And for each bound variable, it gives a list of other bound variables that could affect any of the things that depend on it. So when I am changing dogs, I should also send cats because they have an output in common. And you see that favorite foods is disconnected from that other graph. And so this works really well, um, but it's still different from the way Pluto normally works. And it can still happen um, that your notebook, um, when you're running in Pluto, it works really well and it's super fast. But then on Slider Server, um, it's like more naive and it's running more, um, it's sending more bond values than you, than you think and is running more code than you think. Um, a good example is if you have one camera input and then um, two sliders to select a pixel from that camera input. In Pluto, you just have one, um, you just like take your webcam picture once and it's sent to the server. And then after that, it's just the slider values. But with the slider server, every time you move a slider, it's also resending the picture of your face because there could be two people visiting the website at the same time with different faces. So um, that's a problem. Um, I have some ideas, but maybe you have some ideas. So this is a problem. Um, I have some ideas on how we can improve. Maybe we can like somehow reuse the previous um, workspace in case nobody like nobody else is visiting at the same time. And then also maybe we can uh, kind of give better debugging, like make it easier for people to understand how their notebook is connected and help them figure out the best way to disconnect uh, a bunch of variables. Um, and I'm curious to hear what you think. Now, because we managed to make these requests stateless, uh, Paniotis had a very good idea, which is, uh, first of all, instead of a WebSocket connection, each bond request is an HTTP request. So that means that we don't need to worry about like the WebSocket breaking down and you open, close and open your laptop and the connection is lost. Um, it only makes a request when you move a slider. So that makes things a lot easier and you can do things like custom routing, etc. The second thing is now we can cache requests. So because each, um, like the, the, like I say, the notebook state is completely described by your notebook file and your bond values, that's exactly what we put in a URL. So <clears throat> the HTTP request is a get to slash state request slash, and then the hash of the notebook file. So the notebook file changes, the hash changes, and then the, then the base 64 encoded bond values. So together, this URL will always give back the same response, which is like the state update to show the, the new cell outputs. And so we can cache it. So we set the cache headers of these requests. <clears throat> and so you can see this in action on the computational thinking website. <clears throat> when I first move this slider, it takes it a while because it's computing um, like everything needed to do it. And then like I keep moving this and every time there's a little bit of lag also because I'm in Europe and the server is in the US. But then now if I go back, uh, let's see the two was new. So now if I go back, you see that it's cached. So these go instantly. 
So first of all, it's cached in my browser. So now I can move this and get new value super fast. Um, but the second thing, you can also cache it on like your DNS, so Cloudflare, for example, which means that someone else who's also in Berlin will get these first values a lot faster now. And then the other thing, um, which is also possible, is to do like a cache on your server itself. So if you have an Nginx router, you can have it also cache results. Um, right. <clears throat> so to do, um, we want to make sure that like the difference between writing a Pluto notebook and having it run on a Pluto side of server is as small as possible. And we might need to create some new debugging tools so that you better understand the differences. So the second thing is that we need to make the deployment easier. So we do have a Docker file, but we should really make like a simple step-by-step -step plan. Um, but still deploying like a Docker container can be difficult. Um, and we're happy to say that Julia Computing will be helping us with this. And hopefully in the future, um, it will be really easy for everyone to just um, turn their notebooks into static websites, but with live sliders and an easy way to like run that notebook directly in your browser. All right, that was it. Um, any questions, uh, let me know. All right, that was amazing. I think it's so cool that you can publish your websites now or your Pluto notebooks interactively. Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, the first from Michael um, is, are there any plans to pre-compile notebook code for faster startups? Yeah, so that's something we definitely played with a lot, but it's quite difficult. So first of all, one thing is like, if you change the notebook and it redeploys, you just want it to be done as quickly as possible. So then it doesn't make sense to first pre-compile and then run from that pre-compiled system image. But if you deploy your notebook a number of times without changing your dependencies, for example, um, there's a big benefit in not specifically pre-compiling a sys image, although that does have a benefit, but just getting the package environment instantiated so that plot is already downloaded um, on the server where you deploy. So yeah, we're experimenting. Um, it's, it's difficult, but hopefully we'll get there and we're happy with your contribution, of course. Um, so another question, um, what are a couple of ways um, that someone might go about hosting their own slider server um, Pluto notebook? Um, right now it's a bit tricky and I know of one other project they're using it, they're actually presenting tomorrow uh, and they did it just by looking at the GitHub repository for the MIT course. So that's comput computationalthinking.mit.eu. Um, and if you look at the source codes, you'll find the Docker file. Um, and if you know a bit about Docker files, then you should be able to deploy it. Um, but soon um, I will write <laughs> like a one, two, three step plan of how you can do it. Um, and it should be easier, yeah. And like I mentioned, Julia Computing, <clears throat> um, at the end of the last talk today, they will present um, their integration that they're doing with Pluto. And in the near future, you should be able to do this directly like on juliahub.com. That's fantastic. Um, I think um, at this point, we'll be moving on to our next talk by Benjamin. Thank you so much, Fonz. Um, All right. Next, we'll start in a bit. <laughs>